Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. So today's video is a very highly requested one. This is the one of little Dylan. I did watch the whole entire trial online. I will leave some of those videos linked down below. There's a ton of them. Okay, it was, it was there was a lot. There was a whole, whole, whole lot. And some of it was very infuriating. However, there were some satisfying parts. Like in this trial, the actual state, you know, the prosecution, yells at one of the defendants and like that typically never happens if you guys watch a trial or something like that and you see everybody's all calm and poised and put together and like we're sitting there watching the trial and we're like ah well she she went off for us okay so it, it was a mess so if you guys don't know this story i'm gonna tell you now little precious Dylan Groves, who was born on January 10th, 2019, was found 153 days later after his birth in the bottom of a 30 foot well inside two milk crates that had been copper wired together and chained together and it had rocks in it to weigh it down. How did this baby get in the bottom of a well? Well, I think we need to bring it back and start at the beginning. Jessica Groves, who was 39 years old at the time, along with her husband, Daniel Groves, who was 41 at the time, were living in Ohio with their 14-year-old son, who was a licensed practical nurse. And I don't really know a whole lot, couldn't find a whole lot about what Daniel did. And of course, then their 14-year-old son was in school. Now, according to research and cops that testified in court, neither one of them, Daniel or Jessica, had worked since 2018 that they could find documented. So what they was doing for money, I don't know, but I'm gonna tell you guys my opinion at the end. So this is this 39-year-old woman who used to be an LPN, okay? And this 41-year-old man living with their teenage son and they start doing substances. Now, I don't know at what time, I don't know what all they did, but we just gonna say there. So they start doing some substances. Jessica got pregnant, okay? Again, so she's got a 14-year-old son, 39, 41 husband. She, her and her husband have been together over 20 years, I think 24 years or something at that point, and she turns up pregnant. Now, she is on that mess, you guys. Now, there's different stories. Her, her husband later told people that she was on heroin, and she also later tests positive for methamphetamines and amphetamines. So I don't know what all she was doing. She was doing the whole kaboot, right? But in either way, she turns up pregnant. Now she starts showing, she's getting a belly, she's at home, she's flittering, flattering, doing all of her things because she's on that stuff. And her 14 year old son confronts her and says, mom, are you pregnant? Like your belly's growing, you look pregnant. And she tells him, yes, I am pregnant. She went to no prenatal appointments because she was on that mess. And then we don't know everything that happened from then on out, her whole entire pregnancy is fuzzy. Where we start to have some documentation of what happened is when she went into the hospital in labor. And you guys, when I listened to the people that were in the hospital, the maternity ward, the people that took care of the babies in there and stuff like that, the prenatal ward testify, Whoa, okay, and these people, they see crazy stuff all the time or shocking stuff, but they said this one was one that they will vividly remember. She comes into the hospital with him and she's in labor, but she ain't, she ain't in no pain, honey. She is in full labor and she's telling them, it's coming, it's coming. So they were, they testified and said that she was, they could tell she was on something, like she was high out of her mind because they're like, She's in active labor and she's not, she wasn't moaning, she wasn't nothing. And they said she was also very disconnected from her pregnancy, saying things like, 
it's coming, you know, not like my baby's coming, our baby is coming, or my, my little girl or my little boy, which she didn't go to no appointment, she didn't know anyways, but it's coming, like it's an alien, you know, from the, like that, it's a child, nevertheless. So they were asking her questions and she would not give them any information and they all thought that that stood out, we, like she would not talk to them, she would not tell them anything. They wanted to get a urine sample from her because they wanted to make sure if she was on substances or not because they could could not give her any kind of pain medicine, no epidural or anything if she was already on substances because it slows down the breathing and it could put the baby at risk. And she refused. She would not pee in a cup. She would not do anything. They stated that the husband was just quiet the whole entire time. Like he was just like in there with his hat down and she's in there like, it's coming. It's a coming. And they're like, okay, ma'am, but can you tell me what your name is? Like, can you tell me how, how far along are you? Any of that. She would not give them any information. They said that they steadily tried to talk her into telling them like, hey, like, we're not here to judge you. We want to help your baby. Okay. We're here to help your baby and save your baby and take care of your baby. We're not here to judge you. And she still wouldn't tell anything. So they took her in to check her and they found out she was already 10 centimeters dilated, which they were all shocked because again, she was not showing any ounce of like pain. You know, any of y'all out there ever had a baby? <laughs> Honey, when you go into labor, you're like, ah! you looking at everybody like, get this baby, this he or she or my little precious, get it out. Okay, get it out right now because I'm literally feel like a train beep, beep, beep is driving out of my vajayjay, okay, like it is very painful, but she's just sitting there at 10 centimeters dilated and she's telling them, it's coming, it's coming. They said that when they put her down into the bed and strapped her down to the bed, they could not, they gave her a bedpan because they're thinking if we can get her on a bedpan, then she'll go to the bathroom. She refused, she would not go. They had to literally catheter this woman in order to get a urine sample from her because they wanted to get the urine sample from her before she delivered. Okay, she delivers, she pushes a one, a two, and just pops this little precious little boy out. Who is which now? Dylan Groves, the little baby boy. Now, when the little baby boy was born, they knew right away that he was born um, under not very good circumstances. They said that he was very dusky. He had no color to him. He was born addicted. So he had the shakes, and they had to keep him in the... Nick you for five days because he was withdrawing and they had to give him like I guess they what they give babies is very very sad when babies are born addicted like that now the baby had to immediately be put on oxygen and again she was not cooperating at all anything so now they she names the baby Dylan and they they take the baby they put him on her chest just so it can have the skin to skin and they said that she was just totally uninterested in her baby at all the people from the hospital later testified that neither one of them, Jessica nor Daniel, ever asked to bring the baby in. One of the nurses even said one time she brought the baby in to see her and she Jessica was like, yeah, you can put him over there. Like, I just can't. I, I cannot. Anyway, so she's itching to get out of the hospital, probably so she can get whatever, you know, she, she can get out of the hospital. So a couple days later, they call the husband, Daniel, and they say, can you come in for an interview? They wanted to talk to him. What they really wanted to do was give him a UA test to see if he tested positive as well too. When they bring him in, they ask him to go into the bathroom and keep the door a little bit cracked so they can hear and they have him do a UA and he does a UA and he passes. Okay, so he passes completely clean. Remember that. Hold that thought, okay? So they tell him, okay, you're clean. We we're, we want to eventually get you reunited, you know, with your son. And he's like, okay. He acts like he's going to cooperate, whatever. Children and Family Services, they get involved at this point, obviously. You know, the people at the hospital, they testified and said that they see, sadly, mothers come in all the time that are addicted to stuff pain bills, whatever it is, okay? And they have babies that are born all the time, sadly. And it was so sad to hear them say that it's not uncommon for, for babies to come in and be a born addicted. I think they said they have 10 in the hospital at any given time that are babies that are detoxing from substances. That's, that's really, really sad. But nevertheless, addiction in itself is sad, okay? I'm not trying to be super judgmental here, but like... 
Anyways, but they, again, they said that this situation with Jessica was very different. Most moms that come in and deliver a baby, whether they've had substance abuse problems or not, they love their baby. They want, they want their baby. They want their baby to get better. She was basically just like, get it out. And she didn't care about nothing else. So children of family services get involved and they call a foster mom. Now this foster mother, her name is Andrea and she was 41 years old at the time. She was a teacher for 18 years. Now Andrea, she is married. She has an adult son who is in college. I think he's like 20 years old or something like that. She only has one son, but he's in college. And she decided to be a foster parent because of being a teacher. She said that when she would see, you know, these kids that came in, they just needed love and stuff. So she decided that she would be a foster parent as well. So when Children and Family Services called her and asked her, hey, can you take a baby? Like this is a brand new baby. The baby was born addicted. We got some issues, whatever. She said, absolutely. She starts calling her friends. She said, I need to get diapers because she was at work. She was teaching this day. She started calling her. She gets diapers. She said within that first day, she had everything she needed with her friends. I'm like, that's some good friends there, right? People were bringing her a crib. They were bringing her swaddles. They were bringing her blankets. She had it all by that first day, honey. She was not playing around. She went to the hospital at six o'clock so she could have a training. She had never had training before to be with a baby that was in this situation. She did the training. She talked to the people that worked there and she brought baby Dylan home. Now, you guys, I will leave this video linked below. I watched her testify. Oh, it was brutal. This woman cried. She couldn't keep it together. She loved this baby so much. She said that she took off 12 days of work, okay? She was gonna take off longer. She would have taken off as long as baby Dylan needed her. She, they asked her to describe what baby Dylan was like and she said that he had tremors. Oh, she said his legs would jerk. He wanted to be held at all times, which she had no problem with. She held him at all times. She said that he had the sweats. He would sweat 24 seven, just pouring sweat, poor little baby. And she said that he only weighed five pounds and four ounces. So just a little baby, you guys gotta think about it. If you've never had a baby, a five pound bag of sugar, right? That you can get from Walmart, like a tiny, tiny baby, five pounds, four ounces and just sweating and shaking and jerking and going through all that, like, oh my gosh. Eventually, I think within a week, the parents set up a time, Jessica and Daniel, to come to her house to visit the baby. She said, Andrea, the foster mom, said she spent about five minutes with them. She said she didn't want to hover over them, right? You know, she wanted to give them a time to bond, but she said that she noticed right off the bat that Jessica seemed like she was on some substances. She was flailing on her arms. She said that she was just like too overexcited for the, the moment. And especially if you think about what they said at the hospital, she was completely disconnected, right? Now she comes in a week or so later and she's like, ah, baby, baby, my baby, blah, blah, blah. and she was like, Okay, chill, ma'am, like, <laughs> but nevertheless, she spent five minutes talking to them. She left the room, let them hold the baby and stuff like that. She said that as soon as they left, though, she called Children and Family Services and let them know that she was concerned that she thought the mom at least was on substances. A couple days later, Andrea, the foster mom, calls back to Children and Family Services and she tells them, hey, when is the next visitation set up? Because typically in situations like this, the parents can come and visit the baby once a week. She was trying to figure it out and plan it. And they said, well, the father's gonna come and get the baby on Monday. And she was like, wait, uh-huh, I do what? She had had baby Dylan for 12 days. And she was like, with all of the things given, she thought, 12 days? Like, don't you think... <laughs> Don't you think we should give a little bit more time? You know, maybe a little therapy, maybe this. She, they said, nope, he keeps passing his drug test. And so we're going to let him take the child. But Jessica, the mother, is not allowed to live in the house with him. Right, right. They've been married for 20 something years. Okay. Andrea said she met with Daniel then. She gave him the pictures. She gave him his blanket. You know, she, did, she didn't want to give him a man. You guys, I am... That is hard. That is so hard, especially when you have a foster mom. To, like, I get it. You want to reunite the child with the family. Absolutely. But this situation had so many red flags, red signs, like 
can we give it, but I don't know. It's such a hard situation to be in, man. It's very difficult. Nevertheless, baby Dylan goes home. Now, Andrea did say that she asked them, listen, she told them, Hey, anything you need, call me. Here's my phone number right here. I got you. Like anything you need, call me. If you need any help, if you need a babysitter, whatever you need, you know, and if you would let me be in his life, I would love to be, but she of course then too, doesn't want to overstep her boundaries as a foster mom, but she never heard from them again. Now, remember I told you guys, baby Dylan was born January 10th, right? Spends five days in the hospital, goes home with the foster mom 12 days. Okay. Later goes home with his father. The stipulations for baby Dylan to go home was of course, the father had to continue to pass drug tests, right? The mother was going to have to go to parenting classes and drug drugs counseling and all of this stuff. And they would have to check in with the baby. Like they didn't just release the baby and say it was nothing, but they nevertheless, they still gave the baby back to the family. By May 3rd, okay? Baby's born in January, told you guys all that. By May 3rd, the family had completely vanished as far as children and family services are concerned. They weren't returning any phone calls. They weren't going to any meetings. They weren't doing anything that they were supposed to do and they could not get a hold of them to check on baby Dylan. So at this point, children and family services asked the cops to intervene. They're like, we, we were concerned about this baby. The cops are going there, knocking on the door. Nobody's answering. They cannot get a hold of anybody either. After the baby had been completely missing and the whole family had vanished for three weeks at this point, the parents were spotted on four wheelers in this like wooded area over by their home. The cops saw them, but they disappeared with their four wheelers and the cops could not find them. The cops couldn't get their cars in certain areas and the family disappeared. So they knew that they were still in town or around. So on June 10th, the cops were able to obtain a search warrant to bust up in a house, boom, kick in the dough and try to look for where baby Dylan is. This is crazy that they had to do all this. Like. When they busted into the house, they found Jessica, who was not supposed to be there, but, and they arrested her immediately. However, Daniel, the father or the husband, barricaded himself in the house and there was a six hour standoff to get him about that house. Six hours, y'all. Finally, they were able to arrest him too and they bring them both into jail. Now at this point, neither one of them are talking. They don't wanna talk and the cops are like, listen, I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> Let me help you, help me, help you. Where is baby Dylan? And they're like, we don't know. We don't know who the baby is, blah, blah, blah. Not wanting to come off of any information. They put him in an interrogation room, honey, and according to Jessica, they walked the dog on her. He called me a fuck and threatened to split my wig. And I hollered at him, I said, go ahead, do it, do it. Go ahead, do it. And he said, I fucking would, you fucking bitch, but I have a badge. I wanna see that. They probably went in there and did one of those old, good old turn off the cameras type of thing. Oops, I forgot to turn the camera on. Because according to her, they was threatening her, telling her they wanted to rip her apart and all kinds of stuff. Which brings me back to that class thing I was talking to you guys about in other videos. Nevertheless, the cops are interrogating the poo out of them. Eventually, the husband, Daniel, says, I, we went to the crib and baby Dylan was dead. I have no idea what happened to him. And we put his body here. So they send the cops on this wild goose chase looking for this precious little baby's body. And they can't find, they can't find him. They, they find out that he lied to them. Okay, they're, so now they're saying, they're coming back. They're pulling him out of jail. They're in their striped outfits looking like they just crawled out from underneath the bridge, okay? And they're like, listen, I know you lied to us and you are getting yourself in more trouble basically. And at this point, they got these, they've got they slapped these big time charges on them and they've got them in jail, but they're still not wanting to come off of information. The investigators made a move, which I consider to be a genius move, and put the two of them in a room together, okay? And gave them Mountain Dews and all of that and then just kind of casually left. Now when they put them in the room together, they started talking to each other. And Daniel tells her, I didn't tell him where the body was. And she's like, I didn't tell him either. And they start whispering so low. You can't, you can't hear it from the, from our standpoint. However, the police, they had amplifiers in that room so they could hear everything. Eventually, after much, much persuasion, Daniel ends up telling them 
where the body is. Now, they played them against each other, which is very, very typical in this type of thing. I can't think of a single case like this where multiple people are involved, where they don't try to play you against each other. They're gonna come in and they're gonna tell you your best friend has already told on you, oh, that she told us everything, she's gonna get off, you're the one that's gonna be in prison forever, and they're telling the other person the same exact thing, and you're desperate when you're in that situation. And so he, he straight up just told them what it was. He said, we took the body and we put it in a well. So the cops, they try to go, and it's a, it's a spring-fed well. This is a picture of it right here. So it's, it's like low to the ground. And this was a situation where Daniel had told the police that he used to hunt in this area. And he lost a couple hunting dogs in these wells out there. The dogs were out there running. And I guess they slipped in the well. I don't even know how that, dogs can swim. I don't know how that is, but that is devastating. And a couple dogs, after you lost the first dog, why would you bring another dog out there? Like, I have so many questions, but let's keep going here. So in order for the police to get to where this well is, because it was like miles off the beaten path. Like this is, these people rode their four wheelers to these wells. Like it was way back into the woods type of thing, right? They had to call the fire department. So the fire department got their truck as far as they could get out there. And they got this tube and they were trying to suck all the water out of the well. However, it was a spring-fed well. They could not get the water out of it. So they started fishing. Now, at this time, the fire department had no idea why, what they were looking for. They just knew they were looking for something. One of the guys has this like hook fish thing. And this is a 30-foot well. So it is a deep well. And he gets something. So they start pulling up. Everybody's pulling up. The cops are there. They're taking pictures. And when they pull it up, it's this crate. And it's two milk crates that are, you know, chained together and copper wired together and they pull it out of the water and you know, water's pouring out of the holes. And at this point, the fire department people, they still don't even know what it is. So they set it over to the side and the cops are taking pictures of it and all that. And the fire department people said within minutes, the smell, the smell of rotting flesh they could smell it. One of the volunteer fire department gentlemen said he just could not go back over there. They knew that there was, they still didn't know what it was, but they knew that there was something in there. They end up taking the crate obviously in for autopsy and stuff. And you guys, this crate, it was the two crates that were tied together with metal copper wire. It was full of rocks so it would sink. I mean, this was a well thought out thing, okay? They took this precious baby's body and they had it wrapped in all of these layers of saran wrap, all like tons and tons and tons of layers, and then put in the crate with all these rocks and dumped in the bottom of this well like like trash. When they find the baby's body, well, when, when, they, when they are able to retrieve the baby's body and the baby had an autopsy, y'all, this little precious baby, four month old baby had skull fractures, broken ribs, broken, broken legs, broken arms, and drugs in its system. The baby tested positive for meth. Now, how does a four month old baby test positive for that? What were you doing? Like, so they go to trial. Now the reason why they say they go to trial is because the father Daniel wants to be the victim and say that his wife did everything he don't know. And she's going in to take the blame to say he didn't do anything. I guess they're trying to get one of them off, but we're going to see what happens. And during these court proceedings, like I said, all of these people come forward and testify. Mind you guys, by the way, like one of the directors that was over this case in Children and Family Services had to step down. I mean, this was a big deal. This is another case of where the system severely failed these people because even the foster mom had called and reported and was like, listen, this woman's still on drugs. Like, why are you giving her back, the baby back? It's been 12 days. Like it's not even been two weeks yet. Leave the, I, I'll like give them a little bit more time. And nevertheless, they just gave the baby back to the parents and this situation happened. Again, I don't want to blame the system too much, but it happens, okay, and it's frustrating. So the director stepped down. I mean, it was a huge deal. So in court, they call in the 14-year-old, who was 15 at this time, Daniel Grove's son. And when they do the court, you guys can watch this on YouTube. They don't show his face, thank God, because he's a little baby. And both of his parents are on trial for doggone murder right now, right? Like, 
over his little brother. Like imagine what that child is going through and has gone through. Like what he saw too in the home. Come to find out this baby, testi well, he's 15, testifies that his dad had him peeing in cups for him. So when he was passing those drug tests, it was allegedly because he was having his son pee in cups for him. So it was his son's pee the whole time. So he was probably never, ever, ever clean. I doubt it. Probably never clean. And he also testified that he saw his little brother one time with like a black eye and a busted head. And he asked his mom, like, what happened to my little brother Dylan? And she said um, that a dream catcher fell and he got tangled up in it and hit himself. But he didn't know what else to believe. I mean, it was his, you know, it's his mom, right? The husband testifies and he testifies that he saw her hitting the baby, hitting the baby in the head, like, ugh. And then when she gets up there to testify, you guys, when I tell you, I have never felt so enraged watching somebody testify. This woman literally get out, got up there and victimized herself, okay? And that was like, I would love for y'all to watch this and tell me if you guys see a single tear drop the whole entire time. One tear, that's it. Tell them what happened. Tell them about that concealment. I wanted to be able to go back and get my baby. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm not asking you for comments. Tell the jury about the day you wrapped that baby in plastic. Tell them what happened. I don't quite remember it all. You don't remember that either. I know it happened. I remember bits and pieces, but no, I don't remember. Where did you get all that stuff to wrap baby Dylan in? Outside, I guess. You guess? No, I'm asking you for real. Where'd you get all this stuff? A shirt and get it out from under the kitchen sink. Are you going to answer the question? Outside. You don't remember this chain, those six layers of plastic and duct tape, three padlocks, 12 zip ties, eight wire ties, 18 rocks. You don't remember that? Not in detail. No, I don't. That's not a whole heck of a lot of planning. No. Why would you do that if you didn't murder this baby on purpose? Baby, how did you cause these injuries? I have sit here and admitted. Answer the question, please. How did you cause these injuries? It was an accident. Not your excuse for what happened. How did you cause these injuries? How did you cause those rib fractures? By dropping him. By dropping him. How did you cause this, that <coughs> first two-inch skull fracture? I don't remember. How did you cause that one-inch skull fracture? It had to be from dropping him. How did you cause that complete upper arm fracture? Nothing that I ever did was intentional. I'm not asking for your excuse. How did you cause that complete upper arm fracture? Tell the jury. I have to live with this for the rest of Answer my the life. How did you cause that? You complete? have devoured hey, my Ms. family. Ms. Rose, you answer the questions that are asked of you. You understand? I've admitted to my guilt. How did you and I have to live without my children. I'm done me. talking to you. You are talking to me because you're sitting on the witness stand. Tell them how you caused that injury. This was the part where the prosecution yelled at her. And like they got into a screaming match. I've never seen this happen in court before, but it was kind of like, 
you could tell that the prosecution was, the woman was probably a, a mother herself and was saying everything everybody else was feeling. Jessica's up there like saying, I don't remember what happened. She was saying it was an accident. And the prosecution was saying, well, what did you do? What did you do to this baby? And she goes, I don't remember. Well, how do you remember it was an accident if you don't remember what happened? You know, like how did this little baby end up with a broken skull, fractured skull, broken arms, broken ribs, broken legs, and in the bottom of a well. Like what was really happening? Like that poor little baby. Oh my gosh, it's so crazy to think about. Long story short, after all of those court proceedings, she was found guilty. She got life without possibility of parole. He was found guilty. He got life with a possibility of parole in 47 years or something like that. He can possibly get out in 47 years, which he's already in his 40s. Best case scenario, he's gonna be almost 90 when he gets out. So basically life, okay? And when their son got up there and testified, I saw some real emotion kind of out of him. Okay, can you tell me, obviously it was before that, correct? Yes. Um, so do you know if it was around Easter time that year? Do you know how many weeks it was prior to you coming out of the home? It might have been two or three weeks. Two or three weeks before you were taken out of the home on April the 24th? Uh, it was, uh, well... When, oh, right. The, you saw the bruising and swelling two to three weeks prior to you being taken out of the Not out of her. She, her a lot of her emotions seemed really bizarre to me. Like she is a very different type of woman. This situation with this woman, Jessica Groves, <laughs> and it's very hard for me not to feel any kind of sympathy for somebody. I always try to see all sides of everything, whether I agree with it or not. I try to put myself in that person's shoes. This woman I could not feel sorry for her. I'm, and I, and I feel bad that I say that, but if you guys watch her testify and you find out what all they did and then you watch how entitled she was and how she victimized herself, it was like, no ma'am. It was really gross, you guys. It was, it was awful. So their little boy, their 15 year old son who sounded very mature, poor kid. He's living with his aunt at this point. You know, I kind of hope they change his name. I mean. That's not, that's not my decision to make, but it's like, you just have to think about what this 15 year old's going through. Like his parents are literally in jail, prison for life for murdering his little brother. And so he lost his whole family at one time. Then again, he was peeing in cups and stuff. There's no clue what all that baby saw. I really hope he's getting the therapy that he needs because he's gonna need a lot of it, I'm sure. So, ugh. have you guys heard about this case? What do you think? What are your opinions? Was life a long enough sentence? Okay. What do you think about CPS? This, what do you think about children and family services? This is one of those cases too, where it makes me go, somebody needs to be able to financially hold the state, you know, accountable. Like the situation with the Cinderella effect, I feel like the family should have been able to sue somebody because in that case, the grandmother, she called DCF on her son and his wife. The sister, when she saw her haircut, she called. When she, the sister found out that the stepmom was then homeschooling the daughter that had previously been abused before and she was on probation for abusing her, she called DCF and reported it, okay? And the woman was on probation for child abuse. At what point do we hold the state accountable for that? You know what I mean? Like, it's one thing if it slips past you, but these cases like this, like in this case too with Dylan, baby Dylan, where the foster mom is calling children and family services and saying, hey, she looks like she's on substances. Please don't give this baby back yet. And then this happens like, I don't know. I had some of you guys comment in the Cinderella video that were social workers. One woman, a comment that I read said that you were a social worker for many years and you retired for this exact reason. And that is so sad. And if you guys watched any of my older stories, you know that that is actually the job I wanted to do. I wanted to be the one to go up in the house. I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be up in that house like, okay, trust me, I wouldn't let nothing slide. I'd have probably been their worst doggone nightmare, but try to be 
helpful. Oh, it's a very hard job. I have to give it to that. Social workers, especially that job, and it's, it's not great pay. You have to do it because your heart is in it or I don't know why else you would do it. So what do you guys think? Have you heard this? Let me know in the comments section down below. As always, my loves, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.